All right, folks, welcome back. It's time to kick off something new here, and that is 22250. The initial plan here at the beginning is that this is going to be a short series, you know, maybe, I don't know, 10 videos, something like that, because the gun does not belong to me. It belongs to my brother. So the idea here is to work up a couple good loads, load him up a bunch of ammo, and give the gun back with a bunch of good shooting ammo and the ability to load more whenever he needs it. Now, speaking of the gun, this is a Remington Model 788. And as many of you might suspect, this used to belong to my grandfather. My grandfather was a big groundhog hunter and he had this gun in 22 250 and he also had another gun in 220 Swift. And those were his two groundhog guns. Those were his varmint guns. Now, he and my brother had a particularly memorable day of groundhog hunting with this gun where my brother made several long shots and they got a bunch of them. So a lot of memories and history with this gun. I hunted with it as well. I have shot some groundhogs with this gun. And in my early teenage years, I'm pretty sure I did load some 22 250 with my grandfather. Sometimes he would do that. Like if we were heading out groundhog hunting sometime soon, he would get us, you know, a little bit involved with the loading or going to the range and getting sighted in. And, but for the most part, I'm completely brand new to loading for the 22 250. Now, before he handed it off to my brother, he did put a brand new Douglas barrel on it. Douglas is, is uh, located in our area and he always had really, really good luck with Douglas barrels. So we'll have a closer look at the gun once we get outside in some daylight and have a little bit more room. But the 788 platform is known for being accurate. Now I'm not exactly a Remington historian. So if you're looking for more information about the Remington 788, a couple of friends of the channel here, William C. Chapin has got a pretty cool, cool video. Actually, I think he's got multiple videos on about his Remington 788s and Thorzax has got a great video and Brownells has a pretty good video talking about the 788. So I'll be sure to leave those linked down in the description and uh, I'll add cards at the end of the video so you can go check those out if you need more info. Now, if you're not familiar with 22250, this is a big boy 22 cartridge. Here it is lined up between a 223 and a 6.5 Creedmoor. The velocities are insane or they can be insane. 35, 40, 45 grain bullets. You're blowing right past 4,000 feet per second pretty, pretty easily, I believe. And 50 to 55 grain bullets, I think we're probably gonna be in the 3,900 to 4,000 range. I don't know if we can hit 4,000 with those, but it's a, uh, but it's a pretty hot rod round. Th this cartridge is extremely popular. This has been the most requested cartridge for me to get into over the years. This and 762 by 39. I get a lot of requests for that as well. I think a lot of people wanted to see some 22250 stuff here on the channel. And this may not be the end. Like I mentioned, we'll we'll see how it goes. Like if, if this gun shoots nothing but tiny groups, this may be a pretty short series. But I really think I'll end up buying one. Now this is this is a slow twist barrel. I, I tried to measure it with my cleaning rod the other day and got a little bit frustrated. I'll give that a try again. But I'm almost certain it's a 1 in 14 twist. I know it's a slow twist. It's either a 1 in 12 or 1 in 14. Or I might actually be able to call Douglas. I don't know if that's something they could look up and see what he bought. All, unfortunately, all the paperwork for it, my, my grandfather always kept meticulous notes, but my brother has all of it. So later on in the series, maybe I'll see if I can track those down from him and get more notes about the history of the gun and whatnot. So this is kind of going to be the slow twist testing. We're going to be shooting 35 grain bullets up to, I'm hoping at least 55. I'm hoping 55 grain bullets are still going to shoot good in this gun. And if they do, we'll keep on going up and see if we can find that point where they we start having stability issues. I've heard that 60 grain bullets can sometimes work, but other times not. I would love to see this particular 62 grain bullet stabilize. This is the Spear Gold Dot. These bullets are amazing. They generally shoot well. Their performance is awesome. I killed two deer this year with the 6.5 millimeter 140 grain gold dot and they hold together really deep penetration and our test of this bullet in 223 was excellent. So I don't know, there's a 55 grain version as well and that's what we're gonna try first. So we'll just have to see, we'll just have to see how it goes. We'll talk a whole lot more about components here in just a minute. But well, back to my point, the reason I'd like to see those shoot well is because I'd like to load up some some deer loads. Like I'd, I'd like to give him a load that he could could use on whitetail deer because he's not a big varmint hunter and I'm not either. So if we can work him up a good load for deer, maybe he can get a little bit more use and enjoy his gun more often. I mean, I guess we can go ahead and jump into components. 
We've already started talking bullets, might as well just continue. I picked out five bullets that I want to test today. We're going to have a bunch of time on the range today because I want to shoot 100 rounds. Fire form a bunch of brass, start getting a feel for the gun and how it's going to shoot. So I picked out five bullets. On the left is the 40 grain Hornady VMAX. Next to it is the 40 grain Nosler Ballistic Tip Varmint. After that is the 50 grain Nosler Ballistic Tip Varmint. Then the 53 grain Hornady VMAX. And on the far right is that 55 grain Spear Gold Dot. Now, if you notice the fourth one over, the longest one, that 53 grain VMAX, I am really hoping this bullet's gonna shoot well because it's a unique design. It has got the best ballistic coefficient of any 22 caliber varmint bullet that I know of. So if this bullet will shoot well, I think it's gonna be an easy choice. So if we can get this bullet shooting well, it'll probably be the load we load up for him. I don't know, we'll have to see how it goes. It might shoot like garbage. And honestly, it's so long, we might run into stability problems. So if it shoots terrible or shows any signs of stability, that should be an early sign of where this gun is gonna, is gonna top out. Because my understanding's always been bullet length is more important than bullet weight when it comes to stability. Actually, let me, let me pull out one of these 62 grainers and we'll compare its length to the 53. Yeah, it's a good bit longer. Hmm, we'll see how it goes. So if we can stabilize that 53, hopefully we can also stabilize the 62 grain gold dot. Now I picked up two types of brass. The first thing I bought was 100 pieces of Norma. I was either gonna buy you know, a box of Lapua or a box of Norma. I wanted some premium brass that I thought would do a good job. I I've bought Lapua for several projects lately. I decided to go with some Norma just to switch things up a little bit. Norma's really good stuff. Like I said, Lapua is available. Nosler sells brass. And as far as I know, the last time I heard, Nosler brass is Norma. Like it's Norma brass that's supposedly hand selected or sorted. Like pre-sorted Norma is what you're getting when you buy Nosler. That's, that's always been my understanding. But all of, all of that's good brass. And on the premium or what I would consider premium side of things, I think those are your only options. And then it's Hornady, Remington, Federal, uh, I feel like I'm forgetting one, but yeah, at least those brands are available for a little bit, a little less expensive. I did find, uh, I think it was 118 pieces of Winchester that my grandfather had bought. This stuff sucks, like really bad. I, I went through and weighed them all just to get some idea of what sort of weight spread we were looking at. And I kept running into cases that had creased necks. I'll throw a couple pictures of that up here. By the time I was done with the 118 or so pieces, I had found eight of them with major uh, flaws in the neck. You know, and once you find that, now you're stuck. You gotta inspect each one <laughs> extremely closely. So I went through that and I think the ones I've got, after calling those few out, the remaining ones I think are gonna be okay. So here's a, here's a chart of the weight dispersion of this Winchester brass. I think it's like 4.8 grains of weight spread. And if we look at the Norma, it's 2.5 grains. Now I will say I did find one piece of Norma that had a janky case mouth. It's all jagged and weird. We might be able to salvage it. I think I'll go ahead and shoot it or try and load it so we can shoot it. And then, you know, maybe after our first trimming, that'll all be gone and it'll be fine. I don't know, we'll see how it goes. So I'm gonna shoot 50 pieces of each of this brass today. And we're gonna shoot the same loads in both of them and See if we can see any difference. This might be a good opportunity to test, like, you know, what, it, what, will, what will it take to get the Winchester shooting as good as the Norma, assuming the Norma shoots any better than the Winchester. Whether it's weight sorting, capacity sorting, neck turning, flash hole deburring, all of the various things we can do to brass to make it better. This might be a good opportunity to test it, assuming the Norma shoots really well. For primers, I'm planning to start with Federal GM 210Ms. Right, these are the Federal Gold Medal Match primers. That's another thing I should have mentioned. 22250 does use large rifle primers. So these are excellent primers and we're not gonna to switch to anything else unless we come up with a reason to do so. These ought to do a fantastic job. We shouldn't have to worry too much about primers. Now, the last thing on the component side is powder. And I, I filmed a separate video about powders. I'm not sure if it'll come out first or if this one will come out first, but I talked through my entire thought process of choosing the powders for this 22250 project. 
These were the final four that I came up with. This is what I want to start with. There are about 25 others that I really want to try. It got very, very difficult to trim down the selections. I really had two main things I wanted out of a powder. I wanted high velocity and I wanted temperature stability. So what I got down to was Hodgton Varget, Alliant AR Comp, Winchester Stayball 6.5, and IMR 8208 XBR. Now, Stayball 6.5 hasn't been on the market very long at all, so I'm still new to it. We've done a little bit of temperature sensitivity testing with it, but that's the only video we've done. This is gonna be my first opportunity to see if it shoots well, to see if it'll shoot a group. So really looking forward to that. AR Comp and 8208 XBR are two of my favorite powders right now. And looking through the load data, both of them give outstanding velocity numbers, especially like in the, in the bullet weight range we're shooting, you know, between 40 and 55 grains. But the velocity king is gonna be the Stayball 6.5. You'll go over to Hodgson's website and look at the, the load data for 22250. They've got data all the way from these lighter bullets all the way up to the heavy stuff for people with faster twist barrels. The numbers are pretty amazing. Much slower burning powder than these other three. So our charge weights are gonna be much bigger with the Stayball 6.5. I'm hoping it's gonna shoot well because I otherwise avoided ball powders for this project because I didn't want to deal with the temperature sensitivity. I want to be able to load up these rounds for my brother and whether he goes out when it's zero degrees or goes out when it's 100 degrees, we need to have predictable pressures and velocities. So that, that was a big factor here when I was choosing powders. The last one's Hodgton Varget. We're going to be shooting that as well. Uh, I mean, an outstanding choice for 22250, but I also chose it because I know it is extremely popular and I know a lot of people are gonna to wanna to see it. So for today's video, we're gonna put 8208 XBR and Varget to the side. We'll get to them in the next video most likely. And we're going to shoot AR Comp and Stayball 6.5 with each of our five bullets in each of our two brands of brass, which a little quick math, that ends up being 100 rounds. So we got a lot of shooting. But the weather's supposed to be amazing tomorrow. No rain, so I'm gonna have hours and hours and hours to shoot and not get in a hurry. So seems like a good opportunity to get a bunch of this brass fire form. Now for reloading equipment, I do have the modified case. Yep, for the Hornady overall length gauge, or this one's actually a Stony Point branded one. I think uh, Hornady either bought just this or bought Stony Point altogether quite a while ago. So we're gonna use this to test our maximum seating depth with our bullets and see what sort of overall lengths are going to fit. For trimming, we've got a bunch of options, including the Lee case length gauge and shell holder with the cutter and lock stud. This is one of the cheapest and easiest ways to trim brass. And I think we might just use this during this series, but there are lots of good ways to trim brass. On the dies side of things, we've got a lot of options. The first is the Lee collet dies. I don't have a ton of experience with the collet dies, but I've never heard anything bad about it. A lot of people really love these things. It took me a minute to get this guy torn apart, but these mandrel dies are really cool. So this is the mandrel right here. It goes, you know, case, of course the uh, case mouth goes, goes up and over this guy. And there's this collet that squeezes down around the mouth of the case. Yep, like this, you can imagine your case mouth is between this mandrel and the collet and this squeezes it down. It's a, it's a neck sizing die. Now where a normal neck sizing die reduces the neck and then pulls an expander ball through it, this uses this mandrel system. They are supposed to be, if I can get it put back together properly here. All right, there we go. So we are definitely gonna be using the Lee Collet die in this series quite a bit probably, but most likely not today. Well, actually, I don't know. Like right now, new brass generally has pretty small necks. I, I assume this probably won't even go, yeah, it won't go over that. Might be able to still use it. The tip of the mandrel does have a nice taper on it, so maybe it, yeah, I don't, we'll read the directions. That's one thing I definitely need to do. Like I mentioned, I'm not all that familiar with these dies, but I've just always heard good things about them. Got a Lyman All-American, two die set. Yeah, look at that, velvet. Just a basic full length sizing die and a bullet seating die. I don't know if we'll use these. We might just, uh, just for the heck of it at some point, but we'll most likely end up using this Redding set quite a bit. This is one of their Deluxe three die sets right here. These are pretty nice dies. I've got several sets and 
Looks like my grandfather had bought the carbide sizing button kit and says it's installed into the full length die. So got a carbide expander ball in there, which I assume means we don't need to worry so much about lubing the inside of our case necks. So we're all set with dies. So does that pretty much cover it? I think that does. We've talked over our components and equipment. So I think we're ready to get started loading here, folks. Let's talk over some load data. Now, like I mentioned, Stable 6.5 is a brand new powder. It came out like a month ago. So the only option we've got right now for load data is the Hodgson website. And they have data for the full line of bullet weights all the way up to 70 grains and down to 40. So their 40 grain data is for the nozzle ballistic tip. They show a 44.8 grain max load, and they say that is a compressed load. And if we look at the pressure, they show they show the pressure of that max load being 56,600 PSI. That's a little bit lower than you see with the other bullet weights. They tested up a little bit over 62,000 PSI. So that tells me they weren't quite able to fit enough of this into the case with that 40 grain nozzle ballistic tip, you know, to get up to the max pressure. So we should be pretty darn safe right up near the max load, I think. M most of these, I'm gonna back off max about 1.5 grains. I'm not going all the way to the starting load. Of course, we probably should, but we're not gonna do it. So for the 40 grain bullets, I wanna shoot 43.0 grains of Stable 6.5. With the 50 grain ballistic tip, I wanna shoot 41.5. The 53 grain VMAX, I wanna shoot 41.0, and I wanna shoot 41.0 with the 55 grain gold dot as well. The one I'm kind of nervous about is that 53 grain VMAX. It's such a long bullet, and unfortunately Hornady does not have any load data whatsoever for that bullet in 22250 right now. I even signed up for their new app that, you know, included some new load data that wasn't included in their 10th edition manual, and there's nothing in there either. So I'll tell you what, I'm going to make a last minute change to my plans here. Let's shoot 40.5, just to be on the safe side. That, that bullet makes me nervous. But we'll go ahead and shoot 41.0 with the 55 grain gold dot. With Alliant AR Comp, the main source of data I went from was the Spear website. They have AR Comp data from 40 up to 55 grain bullets. And I tried to back off of theirs about a grain and a half from the max load as well. Which I'll tell you what, I'm going to drop that 53 grain load on that one as well. So... Yeah, and I'm gonna drop that load on that VMAX, the 53 grain VMAX on that one as well, down to 31.5. So there you go. Charge weights ranging from 35.5 down to 31.5. And I think that should be, that should be all right to get us started. It's kind of funny with the 40 grain bullets, we're shooting 43 grains of Stable 6.5. It's not every day your powder weighs more than your bullet. Pretty crazy stuff. Now for the overall length, we're gonna shoot 2.350 with everything. That's our standard SAMI maximum overall length. This gun does load from a little magazine. I don't know if that's a three or four round magazine, whatever. And it looks like we should be able to get rounds up to about 2.4 inches into the magazine. We'll have to see whether they feed at that length, but they'll at least fit in the magazine. So we've got a little bit of room to play with in the future. And I tell you what, let's do that uh, next. Let's use our Hornady overall length gauge and we'll walk through testing maximum overall length with one of these bullets. All right, first things first, we need to pull out the bolt. And I guess I could show you that's one of the neat things about the 788. The locking lugs are in the rear and there's nine of them. Pretty cool. So with your overall length gauge, what do you do is you buy or make a modified case? Yep, you see how this guy is drilled out and tapped? You buy one of these for a couple bucks, comes in a little package like this and you just screw it right on there. There we go. Then we loosen up this, and that allows this to slide back and forth. There you go, and that moves forward and pushes a bullet. So I've got one of the 40 grain uh, VMAXs. Let's go ahead and push that forward a little bit. Drop this down in here. It'll easily you know, go down in there. And we just put this up in our chamber and then push the bullet forward until it hits our rifling, then we tighten this down, pull it all out, and take an overall length measurement here. So we'll back our bullet down in here, slide that guy all the way in until we fill it bottom out, and then push that forward and lock it down. And then the most annoying part, so we pull it out, and you'll see here 
the bullet got left behind. And I, I didn't push it that hard. The problem is this is still essentially a new barrel. It has very few rounds through it. So I think that rifling is still just a little sharp or something, you know, it's just not worn in and smoothed off. So it bites into that bullet and will not let it go. So I've got a cleaning rod here that I need to put down the bore to tap it out of there. There it is. Now we put our bullet back in there and we take an overall length measurement. So we're getting right about 2.471 or 2.472. And I tested this bullet earlier and had written down 2.470. So pretty darn close. The problem with this, these bullets are so darn short, I wouldn't want to shoot it that short anyway. And that's really the way it is with most of these. I don't think we're going to be able to load them much longer just because, you know, we want enough contact between the neck of our case and the bearing surface of the bullet. So hopefully this gun shoots well with these bullets at the standard 2.350 inches of overall length. So this one is going to have 120 thousandths of jump to the lands. And I did this exercise with all of the bullets. The 40 grain ballistic tip couldn't even get to the lands while the bullet was still in the case mouth. So it's going to have a good bit of jump. And so are all of the others. I'll put them all here on the screen so you can see. We're looking at 120 to 203 thousandths of jump. Now you might notice if you're a regular viewer, I never use these. I kind of hate these overall length gauges. For one thing, a standard modified case is not going to be the same size as a fire form piece of brass in your chamber. So if you want really precise measurements with this tool, you need to make or get a, you need to get a modified case made with one of your fire form pieces of brass. Because as we push this in and it stops in the chamber, so the shoulder is hitting, you know, the shoulder in our chamber. So the only reliable measurement point here is the distance from the shoulder to the tip of the bullet or the ogive of the bullet or wherever. The headspace from the shoulder to the base of the cartridge could be much different than your chamber. So a little bit of wiggle room, a little bit of error is going to happen here unless you're using a piece of brass that was fire formed in your chamber. Now the next problem is that the threads on these are nothing standard. I, I bought a tap to make one of these a while back and I was hoping I'd be able to do it without a lathe or whatever and didn't have much success. But I think you can, I think you can send brass to Hornady and they'll make you one or I think people offer it as a service, you know, so yeah. I just don't like this tool. And what I like to use is something like this. What I'll do is take a fire formed piece of brass and neck size it or you can even full length resize it. It doesn't really mess anything up. And then I'll just take a Dremel tool and cut a, a slit down the neck. That's what I'll be doing for this gun. I just don't have any fire form uh, brass yet, so can't really make one. But what we would do in this case, like let's grab one of our 40 grain VMAX bullets. You just kind of sit it in there, you know, so that it'll, it'll slide, but it's still pretty tight, right? Like you got to try and get it out of there and you can adjust the tension just by squeezing it closed or prying it a little bit open. So I would get the bullet started and then I would put the round in the gun and close the bolt, which I'll demonstrate this in the next video. Once I've got a piece of fire form brass that we can neck size and, and do this with. So you just, you close the bolt, you allow the rifling to seat the bullet and then you just pull it out. You got to kind of be careful to make sure your, your round stays straight and doesn't try and eject and mess up your measurement, but it comes out and shows you exactly what your total overall length would be because the base of the cartridge was, was in contact with the bolt. The, the bullet was in contact with the rifling. So it, it, it gives you the perfect number. You can take your overall length measurement. You can take your cartridge based O drive measurement here. It's repeatable. It's cheap. And all it takes is one piece of sacrificial brass. But a lot of people really love, you know, the stony point tool, the, the Hornady overall length gauge. It's, I've just, I've never been that guy. If it works for you, that's awesome. And like I mentioned with this cartridge, we don't really have a whole lot of room to play with overall length because the bullets are so dang short. So obsess, obsessing over that jump measurement, hopefully just won't be anything to worry about in this series. Now I did pick up a couple plastic ammo boxes. These were from Midway. This is the National Metallic brand. You get a three pack for like, uh, it's super cheap. Yeah, I picked up a three pack of these for $9.99. So about $3.33 a piece. It's the same size as 308. So if you're going ammo about box shopping and they don't list 22250, 308 is what you need. 
So we'll have one box full of Winchester and another full of Norma. And with new brass, especially as crappy as this Winchester brass seems, I wanna run all of these through a full length sizing die. And luckily we've got that Redding die with the carbide expander. So we should be able to just lightly lube the body of the case, not get any down into the neck, and then we'll just be able to wipe them off and continue loading. I use spray on lanolin lube a lot. And usually when I use that, I like to tumble the brass afterwards to clean that off. But I really don't want to do that this time because we're on the range tomorrow and we ain't got time for that crap. Now, if I'm not mistaken, this Norma bag came with 101 pieces, I think. So hopefully that one that had the weird case mouth doesn't put us at 99 pieces of brass. There's nothing worse than ending up with 99 pieces of brass. Something just feels wrong about having one empty hole in your ammo box. Nope, it didn't. See, that, that's just unsettling, isn't it? All right, so we're gonna try really hard to salvage that piece of janky brass. Now, just like I was saying, the ammo boxes are the same as 308, so are your loading blocks. So any universal loading block or whatever is gonna fit these just fine. This happens to be one of these big old lime and aluminum jobs, and they fit down in this guy like a glove. Eh. So we're gonna use the Redding dies, and let me show you what I was talking about earlier with the expander. This is that carbide expander, yep, that came in that package I showed earlier. And it actually floats here on the decapping and expanding assembly. But the standard Redding expander looks like this. So this is our full length die. We've got our carbide expander. We just screw it down until the decapping pin is coming out of the bottom enough and tighten it down. And that should be good. I'll tell you what, I better double check just to be 100% sure that none of this brass has small flash holes. I don't think so. <laughs> the decapping pin fits in there just fine with both brands. Good deal. So we've got our shell holder. I think this is a Lee. Hmm, it's a number two. Let me double check that. Yep, I'm pretty sure it's a Lee. It's not a Redding. The Redding has knurling around the side of it, like that. And RCBS has the writing on the side. And I think the Hornadies have an H in front of their number. So yeah, pretty sure it's a Lee. So we snap that into the ram of our press. We take our full length sizing die and screw it down until it touches, more or less. And actually that's just about perfect. The lock ring is tight on this, so if I needed to adjust it, I would need to loosen the lock ring, but that feels perfect. So I'm not sure how much force this will take. Shouldn't take much of any. Like the body of the cases and stuff should already be the correct size and probably won't be touched by the sizing die. I'm gonna use some Redding Imperial sizing die wax. There you go. You just get a little bit on your fingers and put a tiny little amount on the case. And then let's see what happens. Up into the die, yeah, no force whatsoever, or very little, and then down and over that expander like butter. Beautiful. So I'm gonna be extremely light with the lube on these since they really aren't making much contact. So that was the normal brass. Let me grab a piece of the Winchester and see how it goes. A yeah, little bit more force to get it up in there and over the expander. Hopefully I didn't just buckle the neck or crush the shoulder on that guy. No, it seems okay. I think these necks are just extremely tight. Try the next one. Yep, yeah, it's going the same, same way. Right, here's a third piece. That one went a little bit easier. So you get the idea. I'm gonna run 50 pieces of the Norma and 50 pieces of the Winchester. Plus I'll probably do some, a, little, a few extras of the Winchester so we can load up some ciders, double check our zero before we start shooting any groups. And actually, you know what? I'll probably just go ahead and size all 200 pieces while I'm set up to do it. Might as well get it over with. All right, so my 200 pieces of brass have been resized. Unfortunately, that one stinking piece of Norma, as soon as I resized it, I thought I felt a crack right in the spot where it was boogered. And I grabbed, yep, I grabbed like my spare decapping pin, just kind of put it down in there and put some pressure behind it and the crack opened way up. So hopefully you can see that. That piece of Norma is crap. 
and there is a tiny little spot right down on the shoulder in line with that so i'm thinking it's you know it's like the like a lot of the winchesters where it just had a crease all the way down it's kind of like that just a funky spot all the way down the side of that piece that sucks man that really 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 sucks so the next thing we need to do is clean up the case mouth especially on the winchester because the norma is in pretty good shape it looks like it was deburdened chamfered a little bit during the manufacturing process so these will just touch them up a little bit but the winchester was just cut off flat and left so that's really what this winchester like it's unsorted there's no prep done whatsoever i have a feeling the flash holes down in there are going to be burry and gnarly the case mouths aren't pre-chamfered and deburred so what we need is a deburring and chamfering tool here and we just give it a couple twists or well these since they've don't have anything on them kind of yep give them a decent little amount of work there and then the outside and now we're looking better if you don't do that you're going to run into problems during bullet seating this way the bullet will slide down in there nicely so i need to do that 198 more times and I'm not going to do it with a hand tool like this. I do have a machine to help me make it a little quicker. So this is the Frankfurt Arsenal Case Trim and Prep Center. Got the same deburring tools you just saw me use on the hand tool. And I actually already have my flash hole deburring tool installed on here. I could, I'm, I might just go ahead and deburr all the flash holes. But I flip this on, it makes quick work of the process. I'll tell you what, I'll do a couple of flash holes on the Winchester brass. And we'll just see. Like, you can tell if it's picking up burrs and crap on them. So let, let's try a couple and find out. Outside of the case mouth, inside of the case mouth. And then down into the flash hole. Yeah, that one, the first one here has got a big, big burr. You know what? I might as well. I might as well just go ahead and do it. It'll only take a couple extra minutes, and it's certainly not going to hurt anything. And it might help a lot. All right, brass prep is done. We've got 199 pieces sized and ready to go. Now, what I should have done back when I was setting up my resizing die was actually pull out the gun and just be 100% sure I got this stuff resized so that it will chamber. This is a bit of a pain in the butt to do around the camera. All right, this is the Norma. Yep, goes in no problem. Yeah, no no issues there. Oh, I see what's making it difficult is I don't have the magazine in the rifle. That should make it easy. All right, here's the Winchester. Go on, get in there. There we go. Slide the bolt, close the bolt. Yeah, no problem whatsoever. So especially in a situation like this where I don't have any fired brass from the gun right now, that's an important check I should have done. For all I know, this gun has a really re extremely tight chamber or something, you know, and we might have needed to tweak our sizing die a little bit. All right, brass prep is now officially done. We ran them through the full wing sizing die. We deburred the flash holes. Yep, from that direction there. Those Winchester flash holes were awful. I took a ton of brass out of those things. But the Normas, I didn't find any big burrs on any of the Normas. So case mouth is chamfered and deburred. We're ready to rock. All right, so lately I've been using this little Lee hand priming kit. It's kind of their latest design and I am really loving it. So we need to switch out the parts. I was using it with small primers last time. So that has to come out. And that's the wrong shell holder. We already determined earlier that the number two Lee shell holder is the right one. So there's our number two shell holder. Here's this thingy for the large primers. Goes in and slides up. And then the handle pops back in. And it's ready to go. All right, now we need to get our primers into the tray. And 
hopefully not spill them everywhere. Up, oh, I spilled one. Give them a little shake. All right, so now they're all pointed the right way. I tell you what, this priming tool is a bit of a tight fit, right? There's not a whole lot of extra space with 100 large primers in there. All right, let's lock it then slide it into the tool. Then we slide this little thing up to on and that starts the flow of primers. Cycle through it once and there's our primer ready to go in. Get our shell holder straight. And let's start with a piece of Norma. See how these primer pockets feel. Holy crap, it feels very tight is how it feels. Yeah, it didn't get it all the way in. Well, crap. Ah, did I get it sideways? No. It started in there, it's just not all the way in. Hmm. All right, let me try and jiggle the primers back into this and then set it to lock and then pull it out. Okay, let's try this again. Try and there it went. Finally went the rest of the way. And there's our, there's our first primer, sitting a little bit below flush and looking pretty good, but holy crap, that's some tight brass. Primer pockets are a little bit insane. Let's try another one. We'll, we'll do them one at a time here for a second. Sometimes if you don't get you know, it aligned properly and it goes in just a little bit crooked, it takes a second. So sometimes you can like spin the brass a little, make sure everything's aligned. And let's see. Yeah, these primer pockets are just really, really tight. Tell you what, the next one, Let's go for a piece of the Winchester and compare them. Yeah, that, that went right in, no problem. There's the, the first primer into some Winchester. Let's try another one of the Winchesters. Yep, going in easy for those. I mean, not easy, like it feels good, like it feels like a nice tight primer pocket. This norm is just a little bit on the extreme side. So let's go back to feeding from the tray and see if we can get into a rhythm with these. Well, I'll say one thing, they're consistent. All of them <laughs> are being equally difficult. So that's good. This little priming tool doesn't have a whole lot of power which I normally like, you know, I like to be able to feel it. You know, if primer pockets are starting to get loose or something, it's nice to be able to feel that primer go in. But with these, I could definitely use just a touch more power. All right, that's it. I'm gonna get these installed and then we'll be ready for powder. So I'm almost done priming this godforsaken brass. As you can tell, I had to go and pull out my Frankfurt Arsenal hand priming tool that has a little bit more leverage. My hands were starting to kill me after just a few with the little Lee primer. Hopefully these things loosen up a touch here after the first firing. If they don't, I might have to prime on the press or something because it's just, it's just ridiculous. Or maybe try a different primer. I'm not sure. 
but I really don't want to do this over and over. All right, last one. Oh, my like my hand is eh. yeah. All right. So at this point, we're ready for powder, and I think what I'm going to do is use the Lyman Gen 6 powder dispenser to weigh out my charges of AR comp. All right, there's that guy full. I haven't used this guy in a while, so let's run a couple charges through it and verify them with a second scale. Yeah, let's just dump 20. All right, came out 19.9 and my other scale agrees. So I'll dispense them a little bit light and then use a trickler to get them exactly where I want them. That guy is ready to rock. Scoot him over here to the left. And I generally have an extremely strict rule about no more than one powder open on the bench at any given time. But I think this time I'm going to break it because AR Comp is an extruded powder, Stayball 6.5 is a ball powder. The stay ball is going to be over here in my RCBS Uniflow and the AR comp will be in the Gen 6. I think I'll be able to keep everything straight. All right, let's get the powder measure filled up. There we go. And let's see, what's the lightest charge of stay ball that we are shooting? 40.5 grains is the lightest. So I want to set my powder measure for 40 grains. And I can already tell the adjustments way in, so I think I was using this for pistol last last time I used it, which has been a little while. So let's see if we can dial in 40 grains. That was 29.3. It usually takes a couple cycles for it to calm down and start repeating itself. All right, 29.0, so a little bit more cranking. Thirty-five point five. Another adjustment. Wow, that was exactly 40. Okay, the next one, 39.8. The next one's 39.9, so I'm going to tweak it up just a little bit. Not that it really matters. This is already good enough, but this is the first time I've run any of this stay ball powder through a powder, uh, powder measure. So I'm interested to see how consistently I can get it to meter. There's the next one, 40.0. Here's the next one, 40.0. And here's the next one. Yep, 39.8. Let's do one more. Yep, 39.8. Next one's 40. And the next one is 40. Huh, that's weird. Those few, those few were light, but the rest are looking pretty good. There's a 40. Okay. I think we're good. All right, folks, it's time to get started. It's the following morning, right after I filmed that last clip, setting up my powder measure and dispenser. I realized it was like 1.30 and I really needed to go to bed. So it's the following morning, feeling fresh, feeling invigorated. Definitely second questioning my choice to have two powders working on the bench at the same time, but I think I'm gonna roll with it. We're gonna start with our first bullet, the 40 grain VMAX. We're gonna weigh out the charges, seat the bullets, and then move on to the next bullet. So we'll do it one bullet at a time. The Gen 6 is set up and ready to rock. I've got two tricklers. I've got a little Hornady trickler and my trusty Frankfurt Arsenal trickler. I love this trickler. It's so heavy. It's got a nice big reservoir for powder. I just kind of love it. So the Gen 6 powder dispenser is gonna be dropping charges that just need maybe, you know, a kernel or two of powder. So we're gonna use this little thing for AR comp. Dump a little bit of AR comp into this dude. There we go, that, that should be plenty. Now the powder measure on the other hand, I think we set it for 40 grains last night. So 
I'm gonna be trickling up a grain or more of powder in a lot of these. So we'll use the bigger Frankfurt Arsenal trickler for stay ball 6.5. Okay, we are ready. Keep this one over here. I pulled out the brass and put them into my loading block in the order I'll be shooting them and loading them. So it's like AR comp in Norma brass, AR comp in Winchester brass, stay ball in Norma, stay ball in Winchester. And then here on the back, I've got 10 pieces of Winchester that we're gonna use for ciders. So we're gonna load those up with this same load with the 40 grain VMAX. So let's get started. I've got a couple different verification scales pulled out here. So let's go ahead and dial up 35.5 grains. Nope, not 355. 35.5 and let the Gen 6 do its job. Okay, that charge is ready. Scale number one reads 35.5. Scale number two reads 35.5. Five zero. So nice job. Lyman Gen 6, our first one's ready to dump. Yeah, that funnel. This funnel, and this is an old Lee funnel that I've used for years, and it's actually gotten worn and 22 caliber stuff. You're able to basically poke it through. There you go, do you see? <laughs> the mouth of the case made it through. So yeah, I've got so many freaking funnels I don't even know what to do with all of them. And they kind of get spread around. So let's pull out the big Lyman funnel. Yeah, this guy right here that comes with a kit with the different size heads. So let's pull out the 22 caliber one. There we go, now we're ready to rock. These have a little, little recess in there where your caliber specific stuff goes in there pretty, pretty good. I mean, it's still kind of sloppy and flops around a little bit, but it's not too bad. So there's that. And we dump the charge. Now case fill with this load looks really good. You might, you know, you can't see down in there, but hopefully you just saw those kernels kind of floating around there. It's right up into the shoulder. So this is a pretty nice full case of AR comp. And while I'm, while I'm doing all this gabbing, I should have had the Gen 6 dumping the next charge. Okay, so after a brief interruption to empty the full memory card in my camera, I'm back at it here. This part is certainly a little bit monotonous. So I'm moving on to stay ball 6.5. I know we set this up for 41 and I was just gonna leave it there and trickle up the rest of the way, but I think I'm gonna go ahead and try and get this as close to 43 as I can. So the first few, and actually this has been sitting overnight, so this is probably gonna be a heavy charge. A lot of stuff settles over time and I just screwed up. I switched pans and forgot to re-zero my scale. Actually, I'll tell you what, I'll just use the Lyman Gen 6 pan instead so I don't have to worry about re-zeroing. Make sure my scales are reading good. Yep, looks all right. Yep, I'm still way down at 40.46. So I need to trickle this up to 43. Okay, double check it on my second scale just to be sure. Looks good. Let's see what case fill looks like with this guy. Yeah, now this guy is up into the neck just a little bit. Hopefully you can see that, which is good. If you remember here with the 40 grain bullet and the stay ball, our max charge is gonna be a, a compressed load. So even backing off max a little bit, it's an extremely full case, which is, which is all good. All right, I need to crank up the powder measure a little bit. See if that gets us closer. Nope, 41.84, and there's 43. Second scale agrees. So that's about it for weighing charges here, folks. Nothing complicated. I'll get the rest of these finished up and see you guys when we're ready to start seating bullets. Now, since I got my powder measure dialed in when I was trickling those first 10 charges. For the 10 ciders, I'm just gonna go ahead and dump it straight into the case. It's either gonna be right on the money or within a 10th or so. So this is a whole lot faster. And that's the ultimate goal of finding a good load that shoots good and maybe isn't too picky about a couple tenths of charge weight variation. You can load them quick on your progressive press or with your powder measure like this. Saves a ton of time. 
That's the other really nice thing about a really full case like this. If I did get one that threw drastically off, 15 grains low or something, I would clearly be able to see that by the powder level in the case. All right, that's it. Let's seat some bullets. Now for a bullet seating die, I wanna go ahead and use my Hornady custom grade bullet seating die with the micro adjust seating depth adjuster on top. That'll make life really easy here where I'm you know, gonna be cranking on this thing nonstop with five different bullets. And the other really good thing about these is Hornady sells multiple seating stems. So like there's one and here's another one for big ELD bullets and stuff like that. So we can take each of our bullets like this 40 grain uh, VMAX and see how well it, it fits in the seating stem. That's a pretty decent fit. And that's the standard stem that came with this die. So we're good to go. Tell you what, just for the heck of it, I'll pull out the ELD stem and see how it feels in that one as well. Yeah, now that one you see how not really getting very intimate contact between the bullet ogive and the seating stem. So that would be a poor fit. This one on the other hand, much better. Little bit of wiggle. I mean, it's not a perfect, perfect fit, but it's pretty darn good. So let's get this guy thrown together and put into the press. To set up the die, I just wanna take a, an empty piece of brass, run it up into this guy, then screw it down until we feel it touch. Yep, that looks like it right there. And then we back it out at least one full turn. I'm actually gonna go like a turn and a half so I can see the scale on the die. And we tighten down the lock ring and we're ready to go. Let's start out with the Winchester brass. And let's see, I'll tell you what, I need to get some tools together here. All right, I think I'm ready. We're gonna start with Winchester brass. I just mentioned that, right? And we'll start out with my cider loads. So I've got the adjustment backed way out. Let's back it out a little bit more just for the heck of it. Cause we're not gonna be, you know, seating these very deep. All right, it's up in there, nothing's touching. So I'm cranking it down. There we go, feels like we're touching. And I'll go down about another 50 thousandths and we'll see where that puts us. Our goal is an overall length of 2.350, right? Isn't that what I said earlier? So we're currently just a little bit over 2.450, so let's go down. There we go, maybe you can see better now. Let's come down 100 thousandths. There's 50, there's 100. Should still be a couple thousandths long. Yep, we're at 2.358. So let's seat another one of these, see what number it gives us. That one came out 2.360. I'll tell you what, let's go ahead and come down 10 thousandths. I'll run our first two back through. Yeah, it feels like this first load is already compressed. I can just feel some extra force required at the top of the stroke, and we are deforming the bullet ever so slightly. All right, this is a, a third piece. Let's see what number it gives us. 2.348, just about right. But I want you to have a look at the bullet. You see that little bit of a, little bit of a ring there, which is not ideal. It's not terrible, but I think probably with these 40 grain bullets, we're not gonna be able to go to a high, any higher charge weights without just running it into a whole lot more bullet seating problems. Now, the good news though is like, as we move up in bullet weight, our 50 grain charge is gonna be one and a half grains less powder, and the 53 is gonna be two and a half grains less powder. So hopefully we're not quite so compressed with those, but you know, our bullets are gonna get longer as our charge weights go up as well. So we might run into problems all the way through. And remember, this is with a seating stem that fits pretty decent. If you've got one that doesn't fit so good, the problem's just gonna be worse. Here's the next one at 2.348, good. Now, let's grab the Hornady bullet comparator. This kit right here comes with a bunch of different caliber specific inserts and then this little thingy that you clamp onto some calipers and that allows us to measure the cartridge base to the O drive of the bullet. Right now, this is 1.985, previous one, 1.987. See, and that's that's the other problem with bullet deformation. This this cartridge based O drive number, if you're getting smooth bullet seating and you're not jacking up your bullets, this will be exactly the same every single time. Yep, the one before that is back to 1.985. But as the seating stem deforms the bullet a little bit, you know, it, it messes up the seating depth by just the tiniest little bit. I think so the reason why I'm taking this measurement, it doesn't do us any good right now. Our target is that total overall length of 2.350. But what I can do here is make a record of this number. We'll call it 1.985 inches cartridge base to ogive. So I'm gonna write that down. And the next time we're setting up our bullet seating die, that number with that measurement is much easier to dial in exactly the same. Or if you get a new box of bullets and they're a new lot number and maybe they're just not quite exactly as they were, 
It's good to be able to dial in that exact cartridge base to ogive number and get back where you want to be. I'm really interested to see once we switch over to the Norma brass here in just a second, whether they're a little bit less compressed because I think the Winchester brass seems extremely thick. The weight on the two brands of brass was about the same, but I did notice that the, the Winchesters have a slightly thicker neck. So once we get some of these fire formed, I'm gonna be interested to take case capacity measurements and see how much water each of them holds. And plus out on the range, we'll be able to see most likely a velocity difference if there's any significant case capacity difference. Now I'm about to switch over and seat the ones in Norma brass. And I don't really know what's gonna happen and I don't wanna accidentally seat them too deeply. So let's back the die out 10 thousandths and then seat the first one here. Oh, that felt so much smoother. It really, really did. Might be a difference in neck tension as well. Like all, all of these cases were, you know, drugged through the exact same expander ball. So you would think their inside neck diameter and their neck tension would be the same. But the problem is the different brands of brass are different hardnesses and they spring back different amounts and it can really affect your neck tension, even though common sense kind of says that with the same size expander in our sizing die, they should be the same, but they're not. This one just seated 10 times easier. No force whatsoever, very, very little force. It just felt like a completely different seating operation. And look, even though we backed out our die 10 thousandths, we're only three thousandths long. Let's take that cartridge-based ogive measurement and see if it's also about three thousandths long. Now it's 1.991, so it shows six thousandths long and there's no bullet deformation whatsoever. So these, these are looking great. I'll go ahead and seat a second one before we go cranking on the die at all. There it is, that one also felt great. No deformation and cartridge based ogive number exactly the same as the last one, 1 1.991. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna dial down exactly six thousandths. So there's five and six, and these should land right on that 1.985 target I wrote down from the Winchester seating operation. Right on the number, 1.985, 1.9845, and the third one, 1.985. So this feels like a completely different operation here. So much smoother, working so much better. You know, like, like our possible reasons right now, maybe the Norma just has more case capacity, so we're not getting that compressed load. Number two, the softness of the brass. This brass might just be softer, giving us a little bit less neck tension or thinner, you know, that might affect the neck tension. So these are, these are things we can tackle with the Winchester brass in the future. You know, we can anneal them, maybe try and soften them up. We can turn the necks to try and make them a little bit thinner. But if it's just about case capacity, then well, there's not much we can do there. We'll just have to note that, you know, don't shoot stay ball 6.5 with 40 grain bullets in Winchester brass. There's just not quite enough case capacity and we'll get it figured out. So now I'm switching from stable over to the AR comp loads. That's another, going from a compressed load to a non-compressed load will also affect our bullet seating die setting. So I'm gonna back it back out, yeah, like 15 thousandths. And let's start this time with the Norma brass, seated really nicely. Now we can dial in that exact cartridge-based ogive number, right? Right now we're at 1.999. So let's just go ahead and dial 15 or 14, seat that again and then seat the next one and get a number. Perfect, 1.985. And just as a sanity check here, let's get a total overall length as well. This one shows 2.347, so about 3 thousandths shorter than our target. The next one, cartridge-based ogive, 1.985 or 1.9845. This one's also a couple thousandths short, 2.347 of our 2.350 inch target, which doesn't matter at all. Having a nice round number that's easy to remember means more than a couple thousandths of overall length. So that 1.985 inch cartridge based ogive with this bullet, that's easy to remember. And now that I've got that number and I know that that corresponds to the overall length I wanna run, I won't really be measuring overall length anymore. It's all, it'll, all measurements will be cartridge based ogive. Hopefully that makes some kind of sense. It's just the more repeatable and precise way to measure your overall length. Okay, now AR comp in the Winchester brass, I'm not gonna to touch the die because I expect this to seat more difficultly, which should make the cartridge longer. So I, I, I don't feel like we're in any danger of accidentally seating it too short. Yeah, definitely just a lot more seating force necessary and our 
our little ring is back a little bit, which tells me, like I know this is not a compressed charge. I can feel the powder moving in there. So that bullet deformation is not necessarily coming from those stay ball loads being compressed. It's actually coming from the additional seating force needed to overcome this hard or thick or whatever brass. So let's see how much longer that stretched us out. That one shows 1.990 cartridge-based ogive. So we're about 5,000th long. I'm gonna go ahead and just dial five and call that good and run the rest of them through again. So this is exactly the same procedure I'm gonna go through with each of these bullets. I'm not gonna make you sit through all of them, but if anything interesting comes up, if I run into any problems that fall like outside of what we've discussed here, then I'll flip the camera back on and let you know. But assuming it all goes boring, I might just see you guys out on the range next. So one thing I wanna make clear, which I think some people get confused about, if you remember with our Hornady VMAX, our cartridge-based ogive measurement was 1.985, right? Cartridge-based ogive was 1.985, and that corresponded to a total overall length of around 2.347. Well, once you have that cartridge-based ogive number, it's only good for that bullet. You need to test it again and come up with a new number with every single bullet. So I've moved on to our next bullet, the 40 grain Nosler Ballistic Tip Varmint, and I've got these guys dialed in to a total overall length of 2.350-ish. And the cartridge-based ogive measurement with these is 1.975, so the 10 thousandths shorter. So I think sometimes people think they can just figure out a cartridge based ogive number and then just load any bullet to that same, you know, 1.985 say. And, and you can do that, but if you're in our situation where you want a specific total overall length, or maybe you're dealing with a magazine length restriction where you need to make sure all of your rounds are shorter than a certain overall length, or you're wanting to exactly match a load data source that gives you a specific overall length, never rely on like a favorite cartridge based ogive number from bullet to bullet. Every one is a new measurement. So that's it, just wanted to be clear on that. So I've made it to the seating operation of the, uh, yeah, those guys, the 53 grain VMAX. These are those extremely long bullets I was talking about that have a high ballistic coefficient. I'm starting to understand why Hornady doesn't have any load data for these in 22250. This is seated at 2.350. And yeah, I don't know if you'll be able to tell, the ogive of the bullet is down below the case mouth. Let me grab another bullet here and try and get them lined up. Eh, I might take a picture later, but basically the ogive extends all the way below the case mouth at the maximum SAMI overall length of 2.350. So what I'm gonna have to do, I, I'm a little bit embarrassed that I didn't catch this earlier. It took me all the way to bullet seating to figure it out. But what we're gonna do is just shoot them longer. I used the Hornady overall length gauge that we talked about earlier to measure the maximum overall length in my gun before the bullets start hitting the rifling, and it's 2.553. So we have over 200 thousandths of jump in this configuration, so I can stretch these out without getting into trouble. And that's what I've done. Here's what one looks like at 2.400 inches, or more or less. Let me, let's measure it. Yeah, there you go, 2.401. And that brings the ogive right to the case mouth. We can go longer if we need to, but I really wanted to use 2.4 because if you remember, our magazine will still accept 2.4 and it's very close. So I don't wanna go much, we, I mean, we've got maybe five, 10 thousands more that we could go at most. So I'd like to stick at 2.4. So that's what we're gonna load them today is at the little bit longer overall length. Can't believe I didn't catch this. Like it should have been a huge clue. Like, okay, Hornady doesn't have load data for one of the most popular uh, 22 caliber cartridges. That should have been a clue that I was about to do something stupid. All right, hopefully this is the last problem we run into and we're actually going to the range next, but I, I'm not making any promises. All right, folks, here's a little bit better look at our gun. It is a Remington Model 788 with a 24 inch Douglas barrel. The scope on top of this guy is a Tasco. And I must admit, I'm not exactly the biggest fan of Tasco. But I looked up the specs on it, and it's supposed to be, you know, one of their better ones. Eh. If the gun won't shoot, and I suspect the scope to be a problem, we're going to swap it out for something else. But at least here to start, this is, this is what we're working with. I'll tell you what, the eye relief with this scope makes me really appreciate a lot of the other scopes I shoot to have a much more generous eye relief, you know, window that you can use, a bigger eye box, I think some people call it because this one's pretty tight. So I recently discovered that the lab radar chronograph only reads up to 3,900 feet per second. So for today, we've strapped on the magneto speed. 
so we can get some baseline velocities of our rounds today. I am using the Shot Marker electronic target system and it provides velocity at the target as well. So we should be getting plenty of velocity feedback today. One of my favorite things here is this uh, custom bolt knob that I guess my grandfather worked up at some point. Hey, it gets the job done, right? And I think I showed it to you earlier. This has, a, has an interesting locking lug design. Now, when my grandfather gave this gun to my brother, he put it in a, in a plastic stock, in a composite aftermarket stock. I think he thought my brother would, you know, find that more useful or better or whatever, but he and I both agree it belongs in the original stock. It is fully glass bedded, and the trigger on this thing is beautiful. It is amazing. I think when I was swapping the stock back to this one, I, I noticed it was a jewel. I think it's a jewel. It's, it's definitely an aftermarket trigger, and it is sweet. So no trigger excuses today. So enough yapping, let's get to shooting. Okay, so step number one here is to confirm the zero on our scope. And I actually need to adjust focus on it as well. All right, looking good. Now I've got a cider target off to the side, so you're not gonna be able to see these shots hit paper. But I'll bring you along for the ride here, just in case something dramatic happens like trying to double feed two cartridges in there like an idiot. Now, I think I mentioned I was getting on the range late and that's totally okay. I got a couple hours of daylight here, but if we don't get, all, get through all of them today, then that's fine. Man, that fed so smooth, I wasn't even sure it picked one out of the magazine. <laughs> all right, let me see if I can hit some paper. All right, that first velocity was 3,940 feet per second. The bolt lift wasn't difficult or anything like that. The brass looks good. But from what I can tell, I hit low and to the right. Let me shoot one more here. Or no, actually, I think it's high into the left. Okay, that was three minutes down and a minute and a half right. All right, that hit pretty darn close. All three pieces of brass look great. Our velocity average was 39.32, which seems pretty good to me. All right, so I think I mentioned we do have the shot marker electronic target system down range, but I'm not really gonna use it as our primary target today. I've got my, shot, my uh, target camera down there because I think now, I'm afraid we're going to run into stability problems, especially once we get to that 53. And I want to be able to have a target camera on it to look for wonky bullet holes. But we'll use the shot marker as a supplement. All right, so it looks like this magazine only holds three. Yep, magazine holds three. So let's start off with three. This is Norma Brass, the 40 grain VMAX and 35.5 grains of AR comp. Let's see what happens. Holy moly, that's cooking. 41.99 feet per second. The brass looks good though. Yeah, I don't see any problems whatsoever. Let's see if they'll group. All right, top off the magazine with the last two. I'll tell you what, the, the way the rounds sit in this magazine, they sit, the top one really sits pointing up. This thing feeds smoother than any gun I've ever used. Like it feels like it didn't even pick one off. Pretty sweet. Ah, I threw that one just a touch left, didn't I? Still, folks, I think this is going to be a fun project. Our first group, <laughs> average velocity of 4212. Shot marker claims we have a 0.66 inch group. We are at 100 yards, by the way, in case I forgot to mention that, which I think I did forget to mention that. Yeah, average velocity 4212. Holy crap. And I'll tell you what, I really, I do not feel like I'm holding that well. This is a very slidey front rest. And like my rear bag is powdered, so like the gun 
slides pretty well. But you know, with one of these, yep, with one of these short, short, sorts of stocks, with that rear back being on a slope, it really likes to cant upward or tilt upward as it's sliding. And I'm having a hard time getting that really solid hold. So I'm not gonna change anything today, but next range trip, I might go with a different front rest. One that maybe grabs the gun just a touch so it's not quite as slidey. Slidey's good usually, but it's causing me a few problems here today. All right, same load, 35.5 grains of AR comp. This time we're gonna shoot Winchester brass. This is still the 40 grain VMAX. So let's see how these do. Uh, I almost shot the wrong rounds. I've got two ammo boxes, you know, one ammo box with the Norma and the other with the, with the Winchester, and I forgot to move over to the other ammo box here. There we go, now it's Winchester brass with AR comp. Let's see what happens. All right, so the first shot with the Winchester brass still looks good. Not seeing anything to freak out about. Yeah, the problem with this scope is I can't really spot these 22 bullet holes very well. It is a one inch tube and it's, you know, it's a Tasco, so, and plus my eyes suck. I think it's, it's low in the orange, right? All right, so not much point of impact shift here. Now, if you remember, the Winchester brass is where we had the seating problems and a lot of these bullets got deformed. So we've got overall lengths varying just a touch and that sort of stuff. I'm, I'm happy to see it shooting as well as it is. All right, that's not terrible. Average velocity was 4230, which is 18 feet per second faster than we saw with the Norma brass which that was kind of what we suspected, right? The Winchester just seemed thick, probably had a touch less case capacity. Shot marker claims a 1.22 inch group. So I think I'm just gonna single feed this gun while I'm testing. It's like kind of a waste of time to pull out the magazine to put three little rounds in it and then pull it out again, put two more in. So we'll just single feed. It single feeds really nicely. Very excited to see what happens here. This is gonna be my first group accuracy test with Stayball 6.5. So let's hope for the best, see what happens. Okay, not quite as good as we were hoping for. Velocity 39.55 with an ugly 29.6 standard deviation and shot marker down there recorded an SD of 24.7 as well. So yeah, that one was kind of crappy. So our groups have gotten progressively worse. So of course I have to wonder, is it due to barrel heat? I've been shooting very slow. Like it's looking at the timestamps on my camera. I've been shooting about 45 minutes. So 15 shots in 45 minutes. If a prairie dog gun can't handle that sort of rate of fire, then what the hell is it good for? This is a reasonably heavy profile barrel. I don't know which profile it is. I should probably see if I can tell. It's probably the varmint profile, but it's reasonably heavy and it's not hot. The air temperature is in the low 40s, so it's nice and cool out here. Here's what I think we'll do. Looking at how much daylight I've got left, definitely not gonna finish today. So we'll shoot this last group with the 40 grain VMAX in the Winchester brass. And then we'll go back to AR comp and we'll shoot one group with all of the other bullets. Like I, I wanna get basic feedback on all of the different bullets. That way if there's something major going on and I need to pull a bunch of them and that sort of junk, then we can find it out now and take care of it before the next day we can get back on the range. All right, so this is the same load, 40 grain VMAX, this time in Winchester brass. Interesting, so that time the Winchester brass was eight feet per second slower than the Norma. So they're very close it looks like with, with these crappy standard deviation numbers that we just saw with the stay ball. It's kind of hard to trust that exact 
differential anyway. So that was a 1.3 inch group according to shop, ma uh, shop marker. Interesting. So I think what I'll do is take a break for just a few minutes. The barrel feels great. So I don't want to totally let it cool down because, you know, what if we find that this gun is very sensitive to barrel heat and that first group is really only possible on a, on a cold barrel. I want to keep it warm for the, for the upcoming shots we're taking with the AR comp loads and the other bullets. Yeah, hopefully that makes sense. But I do need to warm up my hands just a little bit. All right, so I took 15 minutes or so. The barrel is still warm to the touch, which I'm happy about. So we're going to blaze through all the different bullets with Norma brass and AR comp powder. So next up, this is the 40 grain ballistic tip. Let's see if we can shoot another good group. First velocity was 4207 at the muzzle, which is just about the same as our 4212 feet per second average we got with the with the VMAX. Brass still looks good, by the way. I'm always keeping my eye on that. All right, so that's weird. <laughs> They're all lined up in a row, or at least that's the way it shows on shot marker. I can't really see the stupid things through the scope, but shot marker said 0.97 inches, so it's hard to be too upset about that. That's a good start. You know, this is just getting out here to fire form some brass and see what happens. And I feel like we should be really happy with any groups under an inch. You know, that's a good place to start from for low development. So time to switch bullets again, this time to the 50 grain nozzler ballistic tip. We're sticking with normal brass. We're sticking with AR comp. This is 33.5 grains of our AR comp. Let's see if these things group. All right, first velocity was 37.90, a little lower than I was expecting, but that's good, right? If we're going to guess wrong, it's better to guess a little bit on the low side. Brass looks fantastic. Man, if it wasn't for that first uh, shot, that might have been a decent group. But it's funny, we shot the exact same size group with both of the ballistic tips. 0.97 inches according to shot marker. <laughs> so I guess now is when all hell might break loose, right? Because next is that big old 53 grain VMAX that might not stabilize for us. Once again, normal brass, we're, this one we're stretching it out to a 2.4 inch overall length, 31.5 grains of AR comp. This is the one where, you know, I dropped that charge weight down trying to, to be safe here, and hopefully we don't get ourselves into trouble. Let's see what happens. Now, and I'll also warn you, these first two shots are the ones where I needed to pull the bullet and reseat it to get that bullet out farther. So yeah, if either of these two is a flyer, I reserve the right to ignore them. All right, so that's not too far off from where we expected it to hit paper. The velocity, you know, pretty darn low there, 3,484 feet per second. We'll worry about that later. If they'll stabilize down at, you know, 3,500 feet per second, then that's gonna make me very happy. Uh, gross. That's 2.67 inches according to shot marker. Uh, well, maybe. Can't wait to get the target up close and inspect the bullet holes. Nope. <laughs> 3.05 inches. Uh, that sucks, man. Okay, next is our 55 grain gold dot. Even though they're a little bit heavy, they're a whole lot shorter. So I think we're probably gonna be okay with this one, maybe. I don't know. Only one way to find out. All right, that's better. 
That's very good news. That's our second best group of the day at a 0.93 incher. We're only at 3,543 feet per second. So I think we got room to maybe find a little bit more velocity with the gold dot. But I love that standard deviation number of 5.6, extreme spread of 14. Although shot marker says an SD of 10.6. So we'll just have to see with more testing. And plus we've still got Stayball 6.5 and the Winchester Brass to shoot with that as well to get some more feedback. I'll tell you what, I think I can squeeze in one more group here before it gets too dark. And what I wanna do is go back to that 53 grain VMAX and let's shoot it with Stayball 6.5 in the Norma Brass. I'm not sure if our Stayball velocities might be a little bit higher. I don't know, help to stabilize those guys. Most likely not, but it's worth a shot. So let's shoot these real quick. Yeah, so the velocity is a little bit higher. That one showed 3666 feet per second, and our AR comp load was 3503. But that point of impact sure is way low and way to the right from everything else we've been shooting. Nope, it ain't gonna happen here, folks. <laughs> Ugly, 4.26 inches. I tell you what, I'm not even gonna waste the barrel life on them on those last two shots. So it looks like the 53 grain VMAX just is not gonna happen in this gun. All right, I'm gonna get packed up. And now that we've got some fired brass, maybe we can look over a few things at the bench because uh, yeah, it's gonna take me a little while before I can get back on the range to shoot the rest of these. But a lot of promising results. Okay, so we're about to get back on the range with the 22250. And there's, there's just one more test I wanna add here. We know that the 53 is not stabilizing. We know that the 55 grain gold dot is stabilizing. I wanna try the 62 grain gold dot. It's just a little bit shorter than the 53 grain VMAX. Now th this 62 grain gold dot is a, is a boat tail where the 55 grain is a flat base. So, you know, that adds some length. So this, this bullet is probably gonna to be too long. It's probably also not going to stabilize, but I think it's worth adding to our test, especially cause I've already got the brass prepped and ready to go. It's just a matter of weighing a few charges and seating a few bullets. I am gonna use Norma brass with these. We'll shoot AR comp and let's shoot uh, 31.0 grains. I looked up the spear load data for a 70 grain bullet. They, they don't have any 62 grain load data, but they've got some for 70. And judging off of that, I'm hoping 31 is gonna be a safe charge. I wanna shoot 2.4 inches of overall length because whenever I was looking at this bullet and that at a 2.350 inch seating depth, I think that ogive is gonna be just below the case mouth. So we need to stretch it out a little bit to get the start of the ogive up above the case mouth. And I was testing in the gun, the maximum overall length with these is about 2.475 before we hit the, the rifling. So 2.4 inches, it's still gonna fit in our magazine. We're not gonna be hitting the lands. We're still gonna have about 75 thousandths of jump. Seems like a pretty good setup to me. So that's it. I'm gonna weigh these charges, get these bullets seated. I won't waste your time with that process. It's gonna be the same as the others. So I will just see you guys out on the range right now. All right, folks, it's time to boogie. I'm sorry about the really poor quality of the target camera footage earlier. I messed up a setting on my target camera. I had it on HD instead of 4K, so whenever I was zooming in, it was just awful. So I guess it's good that we didn't really get to shoot all of our rounds with that setting, but it was pretty frustrating nonetheless. All right, target cameras filming in 4K. We had a beautiful day, we've got more time. Temperatures are a little bit warmer. It's in the mid to upper 40s today. So we've got no excuses here. Tell you what I wanna do, let's shoot a couple ciders because I was adjusting the eyepiece on this scope, trying to get it, the focus a little bit better. I got the parallax dialed in, you know, moving my eye around, making sure that my crosshair wasn't moving, but I was just still out of focus. So I was donking around with the adjustment back here. And as I was doing that, I was noticing the crosshairs going all over the place. So I'm afraid loosening this up and, and playing with it a little bit might've messed up my zero. Let's find out. So let's shoot one of the dots that we're not gonna shoot. The ones from the 53 grain V Max. Yeah, this second dot in this row, we'll use it as a cider target. Let's see if we're still hitting where we're aiming. Yeah, so that went just a little bit left. Let's shoot one more just to make sure that's not just a cold barrel thing. Yep, 
Nope, they're right on top of each other. So let's come right, yeah, let's come right one minute and we'll do one more cider. Right at the top of the orange. All right, that's good enough for me. Now, I did change up my front rest a little bit like I was talking about. This one cradles the gun a little bit better. It's not wanting to tilt side to side nearly as much. And this one has a little bit of grip to it. And so far it feels like I can hold pretty well. So I wanna jump right in to the 62 grain gold dot that we just loaded up. I can't wait to find out if these are gonna stabilize. So let's not wait. Now we need to find another dot that doesn't have too much crap around it. Well, we use the dot right next to the one we just shot. So it's got that one hole up above it and nothing else that's too close. Plus we got shot marker to tell us what's going on. So let's see if these guys will stabilize. Uh, where is it? I was gonna bring out my spotting scope and kind of forgot. Right at the bottom of the writing maybe. We'll see what that piece of brass looks like. Yeah, it looks pretty good. I don't see anything going on. The primer's still nice and rounded on the margins. And our velocity, that first shot was 3370. So that's a couple hundred feet per second slower than we were with the 55 grain gold dot. So good, good place to start, hopefully. All right, let's see if the second one goes near the first one. No, not quite. Almost three inches away, 2.9 inches. And we'll go ahead and finish it out here. Gross, gross, gross. 3.6 inches at 3,361 feet per second. I'll tell you what, at least we've, we've got the 55 that we know at least it shot that one good group. And we're starting to narrow in on where the gun stopped stabilizing. I'll tell you what, today let's shoot from heavy to light. So speaking of that 55, let's shoot some more of these. We already fired the Norma brass with 32 grains of AR comp. So next up, let's shoot the Winchester brass with AR comp. Now I'm hoping these will be okay. These bullets did, I guess the seating stem fit was a little bit better than the others. These didn't really get boogered up too much when seating into the Winchester brass. So hopefully these Winchester groups will be decent. So that's what's next. Winchester brass, AR comp, 32 grains of it, 55 grain gold dot. All right, so that wasn't terrible. I guess that second shot there is what screwed us up. 1.15 inch group, we've shot worse. Muzzle velocity, 3557. Velocity at the target, 3057. Good SD number, so not too shabby. Now we switch back to Norma Brass and switch to Stable 6.5. With the 53 grain VMAX, we had about 150 feet per second velocity differential between AR comp and stay ball with stay ball being faster. I think it's going to be similar here. So I expect these to maybe be a little over 3,700 feet per second. Let's see how they shoot. Nope, that was right at 3,600 feet per second. Check our brass. Nothing weird going on with the brass. So maybe I shouldn't have made that scope adjustment earlier. Hitting a little bit to the right now. Man, I was hoping for a few good groups out of Stable 6.5. So far, the groups have kind of been crappy. The standard deviations have kind of been crappy. We may end up trying a Magnum Primer just to see if it helps. I don't know. All right, 36, 38 at the muzzle. 30.6 feet per second standard deviation. What did shot marker say? Yeah, shot marker called it a 27.4 standard deviation. Group of 1.09 inches. So our last group with the 55 green gold dot is Stable 65 in Winchester. All 
Yeah, it's overall eh, a little bit mediocre here with the 55 grain gold dot, but at least it's stabilizing. Everything right about an inch. It's something to work with, right? So before we move down to the 50 grain nozzle ballistic tip, I'm gonna give barrel a few minutes to cool down and take a break. All right, back to it. Next up is the 50 grain ballistic tip. We've already shot the first group with AR Comp and Norma Brass. So next up is AR Comp and Winchester Brass. Now these ballistic tips were some of the worst about getting the bullets boogered up. So the Winchester groups might get ugly. I don't know, let's find out. Yeah, this third shot in particular has got a really jacked up bullet. So there's not much nice to say there, so we'll just say nothing at all and move right along. Next up is Norma Brass with Stayball 6.5 and the 50 grain ballistic tip. Ah, crap. I thought we were onto a good group there. Yeah, but it just gets worse with the fifth shot. Crapola. Okay, one more to finish out this row. It's the same load. Stayball 6.5 with Winchester Brass. Hey, we shot a decent group. It's actually just a little bit smaller than the, our best group, that first group we shot with the 40 grain VMAX. Nice. Those last two groups with Stayball 6.5, both the Norma and the Win Winchester Brass, those are two of the best standard deviations we've seen. And this last group was pretty good. And the, you know, the, the group before it, the first three shots looked really good and then it kind of went to crap. So maybe there's some promise there. You know, something we can work with with the 50 grain ballistic tip and Stayball 6.5, that's good news. All right, so we got three groups left with the 40 grain ballistic tip. Let's check our barrel heat. She's definitely getting warm. So I'll tell you what, I'm gonna take like 10 minutes. Okay, we got 15 shots remaining and it is the 40 grain nozzle ballistic tip. First up, Winchester Brass with AR Comp, 35.5 grains of it. Yeah, so this this third shot here, I was I was a little bit right of my intended aiming point when it went off, but I didn't think I was that far off. But this shows promise, right? This was remember this was the Winchester brass, where we've got our neck tension problems. So I'm glad to see you know we're at least shooting a few decent groups with the Winchester. But next up, we're going back to Norma, and we're switching to Stayball 6.5, 43 grains of it. Let's see if it'll group. Uh, we've shot lots of good three shot groups in this video that have been ruined by crappy fourths and fifths.
Okay, one more to go. Same load with Winchester. All right, so a little bit frustrating here and there, but we didn't get ourselves into any pressure problems. We determined the upper limit for bullet weight and length, so we've learned a lot. So let's pack up, let's get back to the bench, let's get this video closed out. All right, so I think we've had more than our fair share of problems in this video. I've been editing it, and holy crap, any of you guys who have stuck with it this far, thank you. It's extremely hard to follow. There's too much going on. There's several different problems. And I, th I just have a feeling a lot of people are gonna be bailing out of this one early maybe. Or I don't know, maybe the, maybe the problems are what make it interesting. The, first of all, did you guys watch the magneto speed slowly creep off the barrel? By the time I got to that last group, I was actually shooting through the freaking strap. So <laughs> the strap got hit. What the heck was that doing to our groups in our second range session? It certainly wasn't helping them. And that's the other thing, like I've, I haven't characterized the effect the Magneto Speed Bayonet has on this gun. It might be huge. You know, th this might be the gun where I can finally show people a gun that has problems. Like most of my other guns don't really have huge effects with the Magneto Speed. There's a little bit of point of impact shift, but the groups don't go terrible or anything. But I'm usually shooting a suppressor. So on the naked barrel, I don't know. We'll, we'll, we'll try and look closer at that later in the series maybe. But one good thing is that, you know, with the shot marker system, we're getting velocities at the target. And afterwards I compiled all of the muzzle velocities and compared them with the target velocities. And it was fascinating. Both of the 40 grain bullets lost right at 650 feet per second from muzzle to target. The Hornady VMAX was 645, the Nozzle Ballistic Tip was 649. So that might be the way we can go forward, is we just rely on our target velocities, we add that differential, you know, we add 645 feet per second to the number, and we assume that's going to be our muzzle velocity. And then once we get where we need to be and we want to verify it, then we pull the magneto speed back out and make sure that the numbers are what we think they are. Now the 50 grain nozzle or ballistic tip only lost 514 feet per second. So heavier bullet, I think it has, you know, a significantly higher ballistic coefficient than the 40 grain version. I was a little bit surprised there, there was that much difference, right? That's, that's 130 feet per second less loss velocity over that first 100 yards. I was, yeah, pretty interested by those numbers. And the 55 grain gold dot was in that same region. It lost an average of 517 feet per second. So that might be what we need to do, you know, as we bring bullets into this test, we characterize about how much velocity they're losing, and then we get rid of the magneto speed and just rely on the target velocities. The 53 grain VMAX that was flying sideways lost 948 feet per second. Insane, especially since this that was by far the highest ballistic coefficient bullet. But that, you know, just goes to show you, they're flying sideways, they're not gonna be living up to those ballistic coefficient numbers. And I'll tell you what, speaking of flying sideways, see if I can show you some of the worst of the bullet holes. There's the 53 grain VMAX with AR comp. That first group we shot, yep. Going through a little sideways. Same thing with that guy over there, definitely not round. Those down there, not round. There we go, that one's the 53 with stay ball. Here are, is the 62. They weren't quite as dramatic. They've definitely got a little bit of oval shape to them, but they weren't quite as dramatic as the 53s. But it was interesting to get that kind of knocked out here in the first video. We know our limitation now, right? And we can kind of forget about the heavy stuff and focus on what works. And a couple things that really, really worked, the 55 grain gold dot and AR comp. The groups weren't bad, you know, we kind of had this one guy way out here, but whatever, you know, it was trying to group and the standard deviation numbers were excellent. 5.6 in Norma brass and 7.1 in Winchester brass. I think that's a combination that we take out of this video as one we should work, work more with. So 55 grain gold dot and AR comp, we're gonna look closer at that combination. 
Another combination was the 50 grain ballistic tip with stay ball 6.5. Similar sort of deal here. I mean, these aren't crazy good numbers, 9.1 and 13.0 SDs, but they're by far the best we saw today with stay ball. So I wanna move forward with this combination. We got a little work to do here on accuracy, but with the magneto speed fiasco and all that, like I, you know, who knows what you can really trust, but good SD numbers, let's keep looking at this. Maybe we'll try a Magnum primer with the stay ball in the next video, just to make sure we're getting a, a good ignition with that ball powder. With the 40 grain bullets, it was kind of a, a mixed bag. Like, you know, our AR comp velocities were outstanding. You know, we started a little bit higher than we probably should have. We were up around 4,200 feet per second with both the, the uh, VMAX and the ballistic tip. So that was pretty good. But the SD numbers were nothing to write home about. So we might move on. So we, we've kind of, we, we know the 55 grain gold dot and AR comp is something we want to work with. And the 50 grain ballistic tip and stay ball 6.5 is something we want to work with. Maybe with the other two, with the other two 40s, we'll bring the other two powders into play. 8208 XBR and Varget are the next two powder, powders I want to test with. So maybe we'll just kind of start from scratch with the 40s again. And we may end up dropping one of them. Like the, the two bullets both shot similar. They're similar bullets. Like I think maybe we'll stick with the 40 grain VMAX. I've got a ton of those. Those those were my grandfather's favorite bullet for this gun in its pre, with its previous barrel. So like I said, I've got boxes and boxes and boxes. And actually this box right here is a, is a box of 250, you know? So we've got tons of these. And maybe I'll try and dig out another bullet. I, I'm, I'm thinking maybe the Nosler Varmageddon, which is a flat base bullet that we've had some really good luck with in 223. I think they make a, they make several different weights. I'll have to see what I've got on hand. So maybe we'll pull out a Varmageddon just to give another flat base bullet a try. And we'll bring some other powders into play and just keep on working on it. Uh, brass, uh, I could give you a look at the brass. It was all fantastic. Uh, there's not so much as a single flat primer or any sort of pressure signs. And we're gonna be looking very close at the brass in the next video so I can just show it to you then. Cause we've got to fix this freaking Winchester brass. It is hard as a rock. So we're gonna anneal it and then we'll do some seating tests to see how it's doing. Maybe that's all it needs. Maybe it just needs annealed. If that doesn't do it, then maybe we'll do some neck turning. We'll compare its thickness to the Norma. We'll do some case capacity comparisons just to see. I think they're gonna be extremely close. Like our velocities with the two types of brass, every once in a while we saw a little bit of differential, but I think a lot of that was from just kind of our crappy standard deviations. The average velocity numbers weren't totally reliable. So, you know, sometimes we saw a little more variation than other times, but I think the cap capacities are gonna be the same and we'll verify that. The Norma brass primer pockets are just crazy. So I'll be interested to see the second, like now that they've been fired, did they loosen up a bit? I'll be interested to see that. And I actually picked up this, th this was finally an excuse to buy this. This is the Lee Auto Bench Prime. It is a bench mounted version of the hand priming tool I showed you earlier. It uses the same sort of, uh, yeah, same sort of mechanism and shell holders and all of that stuff. But this one mounts to your bench and you know, you got a little bit more leverage. I found this guy on sale. They're pretty affordable. So I'm looking forward to trying these out and we'll see if we can break this handle with this Norma brass. It was completely unreasonable the amount of force it was taking to seat those primers. Anything else to talk about? I don't think so. That, that's enough for today. I'm feeling pretty okay about things. You know, we got a lot of problems, but we'll get through them all. We'll get them all figured out. Nothing insurmountable. It's just little annoyances here and there. So I think that's where we'll leave it folks. Appreciate you joining me. Thanks for sticking through it. I know this was a confusing mess of a video, but it is what it is. So hopefully things will get clearer as we start making some progress, narrowing some things down. So I'll hope you'll join me then and I'll see you next time.